attack unfolded. President Trump was speaking from a stage located here with Secret Service snipers in position on the roof of a building behind the stage. The suspected gunman was on the roof of another building less than 450 feet away from where Trump was speaking, with a clear line of sight. And look what happened! Gotcha. Let me go back. So we can kind of see <clears throat> right there. This yeah. is great. Now, Marcelo, what I was going to talk about was... was I, I don't know if it's the first thing. Listen, I'm I'm not U.S. Secret Service. I never was. But again, I was around there for two decades on a pretty concentrated basis, a regular basis. Right. One of the things that, that we were told, one of their biggest fears was the high ground. In other words, right. any any possible threat, having a clear line of sight from a higher location on their protecting. And of course, that's what we see right here. Now, I will talk about, I could talk about countless, countless details with protectees where the Secret Service would literally own uh, opposing buildings, apartment complexes, high rises, maybe across the street or down the street from where a uh, protectee is staying overnight, uh, speaking, uh, campaigning, whatever it may be. When I saw this yesterday, <coughs> I, I was just... Quite frankly, I was shocked that a building is basically about 140 or so yards away from where uh, former President Trump was speaking, apparently was uncovered by the Secret Service. What, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, there was obviously a, a break either in communication or a break in planning. Either way, something went wrong in the early stages. And I'm sure Bill can attest to this. This is not something that's done the day of. This is done a couple of days before, a week before, depending on the size of a crowd. Now, for myself, we understand two things. Secret Service has inside perimeter security. That means where you see uh, where Trump was speaking, that is all Secret Service, and that's Hawkeye. Hawkeye is the SWAT team for Secret Service. They take care of the inside of that uh, venue. On the outside of that venue would be, uh, in you know, LAPD's case, Metropolitan Division. Now, looking at that high ground, that is where we would automatically put two officers. Even if you don't put them on the roof, you're going to put them on the bottom so no one can get to the roof. So that sterilize the building. Yep. Sterilize the building. Absolutely. Any uh, building, any window, any roof that has a direct line of sight to the president, the vice president, the former president, you will sterilize it. That means once you clear that building, and that is from, from, uh, from the bottom all the way to the top, you keep two officers there the entire time. Because it's sterilized because now you have to secure it. You can't sterilize it and then walk away. Um, so there obviously was a break in communication or planning. I, I'm going to say there was a break in planning because this should have been talked about days ago. That, that should have, there is no way someone should have been up there. Um, and the fact that you had, um, you had people that were there that were telling local law enforcement, there's a guy with a rifle. I mean, and, that, and, and Marcelo, we're going to we're going to get into that because it's you're you're absolutely right. This is a it's a it's a very good point you raise. We're going to get into it. And Bill, I'm glad you brought that that phrase up, sterilizing the the, the building. Um, and and so you spent 30 years in, in federal government and uh, federal law enforcement. I know I'm sure you worked with the Secret Service as well. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly right. By the way, Marcelo, you brought up the point about. Uh, sterilizing with, with local law enforcement. Now, depending on where you work, and we, I guess, Butler, Pennsylvania, it seems like it's a very rural area, very small law enforcement agency. Of course, you also have Pennsylvania State Troopers there. Yes. We know that. I'm assuming, I'm assuming, I don't know for a fact, I had noticed that we had maybe a county sheriff's contingency there. I'm not sure. But Bill, do you want to expand a little bit on that sterilizing of the building? Because people say, well, 
they should have cops on on top of the roof. They could have that, that's a possibility, but there are a lot of ways to skin this cat. So, Bill, I'll, I'll hand it off to you. No, I think Marcelo um, spoke to it already, Mark. I think that, um, yeah, absent having someone on the roof, you don't have to have someone on the roof controlling the roof. But if you don't, then that building has to be sterilized and then covered. That's all there is to it. Uh, you can't allow access to a building with that type of, of line of sight. Exactly. The other thing, and I had it in my notes earlier, Marcelo, you got on top of it early, which is yeah. fine, is the site survey or, or site assessment. It's a, right. call it two different things. It's the same thing. And listen, I, I've been contacted by a secret service. So listen, we have XYZ protecting coming to, uh, protectee coming to town. And sometimes we would actually take secret service agents out to do site assessments <laughs> ourselves because they knew that the highway patrol was going to be doing the uh, ingress, egress from these different venues, things like that. And so they want lead vehicles. Or they want supervisors to be involved in part of the, uh, the site assessment. And uh, you couldn't be more right about these are things that should, and they normally take place uh, days or sometimes weeks in advance, depending on the complexity of, of, of a venue. And that's why uh, I made notes to myself that, that a, a, a site assessment and you know what the threats are, of course, depend on the environment, the particular, the particular event, uh, venue or geographic area. Um, and this one, to me, and Danny, listen, I said, you spent 30 years a firefighter. You guys had to do assessments, of course, in very timely situations where you're arriving on scene, you're trying to assess what the challenges are, you know, uh, building entry or things like this or uh, uh, combustibles or all, all these things are, you have to take the big picture uh, into consideration. And I, I want you to talk about just from that experience and, you know, really being a grown man in common sense, you know, what your assessment is of, you know, where we got, how we got well, to this you know, point. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mark, because, you know, when Marcelo mentioned about a lack of communication or communication <clears throat> breakdown, I mean, just looking at this, and like you said, this is a very rural area. It's not like this is L.A. City here. This is a really small country town. They don't, <clears throat> and you, and we know like snipers, snipers, typically, unless of course you're going to be a, a ground level hit where you're real close to your object. Most snipers, they take high ground. I mean, let's take, I mean, let's look at the JFK assassination, high ground. Let's take when, um, Oh, the kid uh, uh, back in the 70s when he was at the University of Texas. Um, yeah, the t Tower of Terror. In, uh, the, yeah. Absolutely. He was in high ground. Um, and and uh, uh, the, the Las Vegas shooter, he was in high ground. Most of these snipers, they looked for high ground. It wasn't like they had 40 high-rise buildings here. They had, you can see in this small little area here, they had these buildings here that offered elevation and a shooting site. And I'm just kind of wondering ahead of time, it's just like us going to, we can have an active brush fire, but we're looking at the overall big picture. We're going beyond where the brush fire is. Where can this brush fire go? What are the other um, places where the, the, the brush fires can take off? And we're looking at different areas and we're sending fire apparatus to areas that aren't even burned because we're trying to get ahead of what's going to happen here. And just one one question I have to ask in this modern day and age, didn't they have drones in the air at the time? Um, I know that the, probably the airspace was probably off limits. What about drones? Just, I mean, everyone has a drone. I, I would think that the Secret Service would have a drone helping, assisting in these buildings. I mean, something that's as simple as a toy could have had detected that shooter. I mean, that's just, well, so just looking at this. Yeah, Danny, I, before I forget, and this is why I have you guys on, because you, these are things that may have gone over my head, no pun intended. <clears throat> Marcelo or Bill, both of you, Marcelo, you know, being, again, in the situation now uh, in your current career, and by the way, without, you know, breaching any security protocols or things like that, I do not want sure. you to do that. But are you aware in general that drones are used in, in reference to what Danny was talking about as far as doing active courage surveys of a live situation? So in, yeah. in, in this regard of a protectee. Yeah, so drones uh, are used by Secret Service. There are also um, protocols in place 
where they prohibit drones in the area. Um, and I don't know if Bill has more insight to that, but we do have, if we do see a drone, Secret Service will let us know, hey, that's ours. We, we're doing mm -hmm. a survey, uh, an immediate survey of, of the location right now, or they'll tell us, hey, we have no drones up, so let us know if you see one. So, mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. there, is, uh, there is a protocol for drones and there is a protocol for pro prohibited drones. I don't know if you have any any insight on that, Bill. No, I just add that that uh, as you guys know that there's also a no-fly zone established. You know, anytime sure. there's something right. like this, and the drone operators have to follow FAA regulations. So if it's a no-fly area, that means no drones. Right. That's right. And I again, mean, for, for a potential as a potential threat, obviously, Secret Service would still use them. At DEA, we use drones all the time. Um, you know, the, the, the flying time somewhat limited, but that's why you have more than one. Yep. Can, and I, I get a question here. Yes. I, may I ask a question? I mean, I, I've got three extra, I, I mean, I, I was on the fire side, so we were just kind of, you know, whatever we came in after the fact. So the three experts here, you got Trump making a speech. Trump didn't wake up on a Monday and say on Tuesday, I'm going to have a speech. This was pre-planned months and months and probably in advance. Okay, at what point do, do you guys get that information that, okay, on July 13th of 2024, there's going to be um, a speech by Donald Trump? Is Do you guys get that information two weeks in advance, three weeks in advance, a month okay. in advance? Because you don't, something like this, you don't plan you don't come up with a game plan in a day and a half or a day. I, I'm sure this is something that goes over and over and getting your resources together and getting everybody on the same page. Because like Mark's indicated, there are multiple agencies, even I don't care how small they were, you still had to work with these multiple agencies. And so I'm just kind of wondering what the time frame is for you guys, especially law enforcement, getting the security together. And, well, and I'll, I'll take together. it first. I'll take that. Dan, it's a great question. And this goes to, I mean, it's a great question. And it, it goes to uh, talking really about, you know, the secure perimeter, um, because it depends on a lot of things. One of them is time frame. Um, and of course, the environment. In other words, what is the secure perimeter? Well, it depends. But going specifically to your question, um, normally, Normally, and there's sort of, in normal, I said we put quotes around there because there's a lot of, <laughs> not a lot of norm, normality to the stuff. But normally, we're going to get, you know, a seven or 10 or 14 day notice about, um, say, a POTUS visit normally uh, over the years. Now, they've been a lot tighter than that. They've been a lot tighter than that. Sometimes we get a call, you know, 72 hours. Uh, now, most of those types of things are, are, generally in response to maybe a natural disaster the president wants to come out to do an assessment or things like that but generally speaking you're going to have enough time to do the types of things that we're talking about today going out looking at these buildings in this case in this case you you don't have very many of these buildings at all it's mm -hmm. not like the stuff that i know marcelo deals with today and i dealt with for for two decades in, in, in Southern California and densely populated areas with high rises all around you or going down to Pacific Coast Highway, one side's the ocean with houses, the other side has high rise apartments and the president's staying on this side. And it, in other words, just incredibly complicated. This looks pretty simple, but to answer your question, Danny, it, it varies, but certainly enough time to do an assessment um, to the point where most people feel comfortable and to coordinate as you alluded to, to the various allied agencies that are involved, the people on the ground that actually make all these things move. The Secret Service is really focused, like Mar Marcelo said, on that protectee, on that tight, tight circle around the protectee. And they depend on local law enforcement, state law enforcement, county law enforcement to move all the parts around to keep that bubble around the protectee. So, Marcelo, I know I said a lot, but you can take it from there about time frames. Yeah, uh, and, and Mark's correct. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll say this. A Secret Service is, is very aware of situations like this. Um, and if, if we only have 72 hours notice, which is ne almost never happens, they're so apologetic because it's something that just came up. 
And there, that's the first thing they say to us. Hey, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. This just was put on our calendar. We're on crunch time. And it, it, it's basically all hands on deck. Is it ideal? Absolutely not. Um, does it happen? Yeah, unfortunately, once in a while it does happen. But normally we're talking weeks out. And for something like this for us, we would have been on that site probably 10 times before we even started our tactical plan. And, and it's something that we share with Secret Service. And a lot of times we'll go out with Secret Service because they want to know our input. Like, well, we're going to be here, but what about, what are you, what's your thoughts on this? So they're very good in, in, um, in communicating intelligence with us. And, and so we, uh, we have a really great uh, rapport with them. We really do. When we tell them, hey, we need to put someone here, here, and here, they're like, hey, great, let's do it. You know, can we get the manpower? Because their big issue is uh, the manpower, and we do everything we can. We, on, on something like this, um, we would have brought in two platoons, both B and C platoon, to cover this whole area. And, this and, whole and Marcelo, explain, explain to everybody what that means logistically or numbers wise, platoons, how big those are. So, our, our platoon is about 30 uh, officers each platoon. So, we would have had 60 officers in the where the uh, supposed shooter was and around that entire area. That would have been closed off. So, we would have had probably all 60 officers with, I mean, no one would have got through there, not the back, not the side. We would have just closed that whole area off because it's a danger zone. Um, and with that, we would have had, you know, in addition to our security there, we would have had what we call our, our CAT team, which is an, a counter assault team um, ready to go. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not knocking the, the Secret Service. Uh, I think they, they do a tremendous job. And Bill, you can jump in here. Um, but there, at some point, there was some lack of communication. Uh, there was a failure in planning because if we're looking where the shooter is, I mean, that is a direct line of sight to President Trump. I mean, that that right there is is a, a, an extreme failure. I mean, it, it really is. And we're talking from a tactical perspective. Uh, standpoint right and i'm not blaming anyone specific i'm just saying that my friends should have been covered i don't know if you have and, any and mark let me that. let me just jump in you know to, to touch on something marcelo said and let's remember that i think the experience marcelo is talking about is working with a quote presidential detail mm -hmm. and i want to point that out now i know we're going to probably you know the, the discussion is going to end up here later but this is not a full presidential detail Right. This is Correctly. basically not, it's not a candidate detail. It's a past president detail. The resources are limited compared to the vastly limited compared to that of an active president. That, so that's number one. And, we'll, and I'm sure we'll get back to that later. The second thing I want to talk about. With, you know, having that outer perimeter and recognizing uh, the capability of firearms, like I, I saw early on someone reporting Oh, this is obviously someone with law enforcement experience or a military CIA sniper that took this shot. Absolute BS. This yeah. is a 130, 140 yard shot. I, Mark, I could take someone with my rifle. I could teach them to, with a low power variable optic, like say three, three time optic, I could teach them to sight that optic and within 30 minutes have them making that shot um, seven, eight out of 10 times. It's not, when you're a prone position with a tripod, it's a very easy shot to make with a uh, 16 inch barrel rifle, which I'm assuming that was any, any you know, mm -hmm. to be legal, anywhere 14 inches and up, and it, a relatively easy shot. And that's what's missed here with that outer perimeter or that second per perimeter is not taking into consideration the, the, the capabilities of uh, of guns like that. That's Bill, such a good I point, so Bill. I, so I don't want to cut you off, Mark, but that's yeah, Bill. That is such a great point. Um, what the media is telling you about this guy is absolutely BS. If yeah. this guy was actually an experienced sniper, we would be talking about President Trump 
funeral, unfortunately. 100%. Yes. 100%. There is no doubt. Such a great point. Um, And and just by the clothes that he was wearing, you can tell this guy was just one, I mean, obviously a nutbag. But if you have a, a white background, you're wearing all white clothes to blend into that white background. This guy was wearing all kinds of different clothing, which, thank, yeah, thank God that he was because uh, the Secret Service sniper was able to, like, identify him right away um, you know, and take, and take that you shot. Know what, Marcia, Mark, go ahead. You had a point you were making there a second ago. Yeah, what I was going to say is, it, and, and Marcelo, it, uh, Bill made the point. Bill made yeah. that point. I was nodding my head because, Bill, I heard some of these same, or at least, you know, maybe it's the same person about, it's like, no, 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 no. I would, listen, and by the way, I'm not a ballistics expert. You know, I fired a tremendous, you know, number of types of weapons, not as many as Marcelo uh, has and still does, and he's better on this than I am. But I can tell you right now, without any question, without any question, that shot could have been made, thank God it wasn't, that shot could have been made with iron sights at 130 yep. yards. Yep. So oh, yeah. forget a scope. In Easy. other words, a, a, a 223 or similar round, and we could talk all day long about ballistics, things like that, and bore people to death. But the type of bullet that was likely used in this, the type of weapon that's likely used in this, depending on the wood, uh, the, wood the wind, uh, at, at things like this, maybe even the temperature, somebody with just some basic, basic training, so some basic repetition, with iron sights, and there was no optical scope, ladies and gentlemen, could have made this shot if they were just somewhat trained in it. So that's how close this was, given the weapon that was used, that we think that mm-hmm. was used. That was the point I wanted to make on that. So I'm glad you, you brought that up, Bill, and, and Marcelo, you confirmed that. We all have to know that. By the way, that goes back to Lee Harvey Oswald, Danny opened up about the Dallas shooting in 1963. Right. There was no yeah. scope on that gun. He was that much much closer than this guy was. Right, right, exactly. Not to to mention, too, Trump turned to the last second. Yeah, and by the way, this could have been, we don't know. It's just pure luck, Anthony, in other words. Uh, But even that close, that guy still had time. Donald Trump is a very, very large man, and there's plenty of kill zone from here down to your belly. And uh, and that that guy missed the the former president, thank goodness. The other thing... uh, Marcel, you were talking about about the interaction and cooperation with the Secret Service. And boy, I I would be remiss if I did not echo what you said. I worked with them a long time. Uh, your counterparts, Bill, I worked with a lot of special agents in charge, SACs, with the with the uh, in Los Angeles field office, Secret Service. And I'm telling you right now, almost to a person, they were all absolutely wonderful people. They were nothing but gracious, nothing but thankful for the uh, support that we showed them, and they just this never ending um, announcement that we secret service, we cannot do our job. We cannot protect anybody without you, Ohio patrol, without you, LAPD, without you, Los Angeles County Sheriff's department. They are very, very humble and, uh, and very grateful for the support. Now, having said that, this is what I think Marcelo can probably um, Mm -hmm. attest to this. The truth is, is that, California gets a tremendous amount of dignitaries visiting, a tremendous amount, especially given the, you know, which political party happens to be in office. Listen, we called Bill Clinton dollar bill because he came 42 <laughs> times in eight years in, um, in, in, in office and made a lot of us a lot of overtime money. That was his nickname. So it was almost like just part of the job. Well, the president's back tomorrow, you know, so to speak. Right. But there's something as irritating as it can be, and it can. It, 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 it tires them because it can be very stressful. You're driving a lead vehicle, the presence behind you in the presidential limousine, and you better make sure you make the right turn. Um, but there's something that comes with that. It's very important. I think it's very relevant to what happened two days ago in Pennsylvania. The Secret Service would would talk to all of us in in large briefings, the multiple agencies that are dealing with a particular visit or a debrief, a debrief from a a past visit. And they would say, look, we deal with you, Ohio Patrol. We deal with you, LAPD. We deal with you, LA County Sheriff's Department. You guys are the best in the business. One of the reasons is because these are all very large agencies. And I'm sure this is true for San Francisco or maybe even, you know, other 
other smaller, large agencies like Sa Sacramento or San Diego, you get a lot of repetition. The things that Marcelo is talking about, about sanitizing a building bill you talked about, these are automatic. You, you almost, you have to think about them, but it's almost automatic about what to do when the protectee is coming. These are things. You flip your book, you go back to last, okay, you know, the last visit, we did this right, we did, we could have done this better, blah, 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 whatever. You have a tremendous amount of, of pedigree, of, of information to draw up on. And so you kind of become experts in your role. When you're dealing with small towns who may only see a president come to do a campaign or a visit once ever, this is all the first time for these allied agencies. It's almost always the first time for the cooperation between the Secret Service and some of these agencies because there's just never a never need to train together or things like this. And so some of this breakdown could have come from maybe that lack of repetition and lack of, you know, kind of robust relationship with the other agencies, large ones, you know, experience the Secret Service. So those are the points that I wanted to make there. Um, could, could I add in on the outside view? Um, yes. I feel like... Because there's a clip that I want to show with the um, the snipers engaging with the, the the suspect, and I just can't help think what you said. Sure, a hundred percent, but it's a two way street as far as communication and stuff like that. And again, I'm the outside. I've never been in those positions that you guys have been in and stuff like that. And I'm kind of thinking like in terms of the the average Joe watching what happened yesterday, and and. A lot of people feel like there was some issues as far as communications, probably. Um, I don't know. There's just something up with it. And people are kind of scratching their heads because we see, I'll show you this video of the snipers engaging with the suspect and not even, and letting just Trump talk. And I don't know how long they've been watching this guy on the roof. And we'll get into witnesses as well when they're trying to tell the, the law enforcement there, hey, there's a guy on the roof with a gun. He's army crawling on the roof. He's right over here. I could see him. And then that communication just doesn't, you know, so I don't know if it's a local law enforcement or if it's the the Secret Service, but in a way it's kind of both of them because where where was the communication breakdown? You know, well, I think they, they, point, can, Anthony. they can point fingers all day, but it's at the same time, one a person got killed trying to protect his family, and Trump got shot, mm -hmm. so and, and a, someone else died. Failure. And so, yeah. someone, right. someone else died. So I'll tell right. you what, no, it's, a, it's a great jumping off point as far as this this kind of next area. Uh, hey, Mark, can I, can I ask Bill just one question real quick? Uh -huh. Bill mentioned earlier about um, a reduced presidential security force. Was that a common practice to have this reduced? I mean, it, was that a decision that Trump made or was or was that taken away from him due to his, uh, all the things that he's going through uh, with his convictions and all that sort of stuff? Did the Secret Service take away that protection or was that was just something common practice where doing these rallies, he doesn't typically have a larger uh, security force? Mm -hmm. So just just common practice, Danny. In other words, because he's not the current sitting president, he gets the same detail that any other past living president would get. And it's it's not at the same strength. And, and you know, without getting into the resources right now, Mark, I do want to say one thing. The, CIA, the uh, Secret Service has struggled over the past few years to staff these details, and they've even instituted something called hirebacks, which is extremely unusual in the federal government, where... They are hiring back retired special agents, allowing them to collect their retirement and putting them back on the payroll and paying them the salary uh, to supplement protective details because they're so shorthanded. But that goes to the, the overall uh, difficulties in recruiting and law enforcement right now. Bill, wow. it's a, and Danny, hope that answers your question. Yeah, that did. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, yes. and it, uh, Bill, you nailed it with that. It's, it's nothing unusual in the sense that a former president's resources are drawn back. That's standard for every former president. But there is a little controversy going on here. I'm a little bit uh, off off the map here right now, but there's a controversy going on about um, uh, uh, about claims that the Trump campaign or Trump himself have asked for more resources than he actually has right now because high threat level. 
uh, and the Secret Service adamantly denies that those requests have not been made. However, I've actually heard the person in charge, so I think we'll talk about her in the end, uh, mm -hmm. saying something to the effect that she's not going to protect the nightclub, uh, referring to Mar-a-Lago. Uh, 